everyone, and welcome to our final Human Rights in Practice event of the semester. We're really happy to see you all here, especially at a very busy time of the semester. The Human Rights in Practice series is organized by the Center for International and Comparative Law and the Duke International Human Rights Clinic. And today's event is also part of the Duke at Home in the World series. Um, our event today, as with our events throughout the semester, is co-sponsored by the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Human Rights Law Society, and the International Law Society. So huge thanks to all of our co-sponsors for co-sponsoring our events throughout the course of the semester. Um, my name is Aya fujimura Fanzo, and I'm the Clinical Professor of Law Teaching and Supervising Attorney in the International Human Rights Clinic. And I'm very, very happy to welcome our three speakers today. And I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. So we'll be starting with Tarana Bagarova, the Associate Country Visit Officer at the OSCE Office of the Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings, with the OSCE being the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. We'll then hear from Professor Shaban Ulali, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Persons, especially Women and Children, and also the Established Professor of Human Rights Law and Director of the Irish Centre for Human Rights at the School of Law, National University of Ireland, Galway. And finally, we'll hear from Professor Jane Huckerby, Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the International Human Rights Clinic here at Duke Law School. Um, so following each of the speakers, we'll open it up for Q&A for the last 15, 20 minutes. So if there are any questions or reflections you think of throughout the course of the presentations, please keep them in mind, and we're eager for a conversation at the end. Thank you again, and I will turn it over to Tarana. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I think everyone can hear me. Great to be here. Thanks for inviting. Um, I would like to share our research and it's a great opportunity for me to, to speak about it as I was in the UK last week and there were new cases I just heard about it and I was um, uh, not uh, positively excited I have to say that there are cases are coming up and we, we keep hearing about it more and more. So just a few years ago we came up with this idea to look at the nexus between human trafficking and terrorism. And we cooperated with uh, several experts across different disciplines on human trafficking and terrorism. And Jane is one of them as uh, a major draft of the report. So we looked at to understand where the crime intersects. So we looked at the legislative framework. We collected around 60 cases across the OEC. Just to say the OEC is an international organization that, in, in, that has 57 participating states. So we cover the broader European, the Central Asia Caucasus, United States and Canada. So we looked at to understand where uh, we can collect those cases. So we collected through the interviews, through the international organizations, NGOs, some of the family members of those who actually have been recruited or have taken by their family members to ISO at that time. Um, so they came up, with, they gave us a lot of this information. So these cases actually covered the period between 2016 and 2020. I'm primarily look at the recruitments done during the ISIL um, operations in Syria and Iraq. So in the course of the, uh, the number of years, we looked at those cases, we examined uh, those cases, and we came up with this report. But before I go into the cases, we just looked at the disciplines itself, first of all. We looked at where the, if there, to identify the similarities, we first wanted to look at where the differences, because there are lots of discussions about that this is a completely two distinct crimes. They cannot intersect. So of course, there is, like we all know, that there is no international agreed framework um, shared by the states to combat terrorism the same ways that the Palermo Protocol sought in, in 2000. So there is no that common structure as four Ps, like prevention, protection, and prosecution, the way it's done in trafficking, it doesn't exist in terrorism. Of course, there's more and more discussion still ongoing. The UN is working a lot, um, uh, uh, but still there is still a major focus on prosecution of criminals and perpetrators. So the major differences we could also see on the purpose of intent. So when we looked at the both crimes, we, we could see the purpose of criminal intent of human trafficking differs from that of terrorism. 
So the intent of the traffic is to exploit the person and gain profit uh, and take advantage from the exploitation of a person. But in contrast, um, the intent of terrorism, it's often understood as intimidation of a population uh, or compelling of a government or international organization to do or to refrain from doing anything. So this, um, again, was a lot of discussion around whether there is actual exploitation that's happening. Also, the people could be deceived, but if there's not a third element or intent to, to, to exploit anyone, does this case actually amount to trafficking? So then brought us the topic about who are the victims and how can we actually understand the, the perception of a victim? In trafficking, the international framework is very clear. The person, the victim of trafficking as any national person who is subject to trafficking human beings, that is the person who has been recruited, harbored or transferred with a different means could be a forced deception, abuse of position of vulnerability for the purpose of exploitation or with the intent to exploit a person. So again, as I said, the protection of victims is the sole part of human trafficking. Also, unfortunately, there's less and less protection we could see in many countries. Uh, the trafficking victims are also being prosecuted in many ways, but uh, at least the international framework around trafficking is about protection. It's not about prosecution per se, which is Council of Europe Convention looked at more broadly than the UNTOC. So this again brought us the issue of victims of terrorism. At that time, when we were discussing in 2016 and 2020, there were a lot of discussion, but there was not major work. The United Nations came up with this model legislation last year, which already defines human trafficking victims among the victims of terrorism. So it is, which is a good development in the side, but still there are countries that needs to do a bit more to understand whether or not who actually can qualify as a victim of um, terrorism, whether or not victims of trafficking actually can be also victims of terrorism. So despite these varying degrees and approaches, we could see lots of similarities between the cases. So these 60 cases that we examined, we realized there were actually um, a lot of uh, similarities between the, how the people were recruited, how the people were transported, transferred or harbored, uh, and this use of different means. So the people were deceived, were forced, they were coerced, uh, their, their abuse, their position were abused or their vulnerability were abused by the person. So these kind of means were very similar to how the traffickers actually operate. So we could see how the deceptive promises, for example, were target, they were targeting individuals with deceptive promises of idyllic life. There were so many young girls actually joined, and Shamima Begum case is one of these. They were bright ones, how they were actually recruited, groomed online with the promises of idyllic life, romance, and, and, and love. Uh, so what's known in the trafficking field as a lover boys, which is a widely known technique by the traffickers to lure young girls. It's been widely used by terrorist groups to lure those girls. And of course, when we're talking, it's not only just the girls, we also looked at adults, male. We also looked at the kids, uh, boys as well. So the gainful employment were used a lot by to bring Central Asian migrants, for example, who were working in Russian Federation to bring them to ISIL because they were already in vulnerable and abusive, exploitative working conditions. So it was very easy target for people, for traffickers to bring them into community centers, to bring them into the religious centers where they were actually brainwashed, they were discussed, so they were given uh, these deceptive, gainful employment prom promises, but they actually ended up not in the construction sites, but in the field, in the battlefield. So then online recruitment, as I said, the cyber enticement and grooming is one of the strongest elements how the ISIL actually worked. ISIL was uh, probably one of the strongest use of how they actually worked on the internet or how they abuse the power of internet to, to actually target both adults and individuals. The online grooming, I don't, I'm not sure how much uh, the online grooming technique is known to the uh, participants. The online grooming is very strong psychological technique used by the trafficker to when we're talking about grooming, of course, it re relates to sexual exploitation, but now it's been used in a wider sense to understand how actually can an adult groom an, an individual, a child online, which was used quite um, widely by terrorist groups. So this modus operandi showed us that there is lots of similarities between the techniques that is used 
And we looked at some of these uh, cases where the family members even used in the Central Asian countries, where the family members had, they, the traffickers used the family members to bring those individuals to, um, uh, to Syria and Iraq. So when we talked about, again, means, so there are, the means of exploitation, um, uh, it's exhaust, it's not exhaustive. So there, there's, it could be a lot. So, but we looked at the coercion, we looked at the force, and we realized if people were recruited by deceptive means, but then this means actually was changed to force and compulsion when they actually reached the area. Passport confiscation, it was widely used by terrorist groups. When they, as soon as the person landed, they took the passports and it's one of the strongest tools to actually control the person because then person cannot actually move around without identity document. So that was an example how we could also see lots of women uh, ranging between 19 to 38 years old. They were tricked uh, to, to ISIL and then they were actually were forced to lie to their parents, to their family members, saying that they're actually living in a good conditions. But their passports were taken and so after some time they had to remarry and remarry and remarry. In the cases that we had from South Caucasus, we had the woman who had to deliver a, a, a large number of children very short period of time. So that was a um, major focus of, uh, of ISIL, how they wanted to bring more women, more young population so that they can actually um, increase um, the membership, increase the female, the male, uh, with the promises that they can actually get um, um, uh, sex slaves, I would say. So this used also to galvanize fighters. So it's not only that they used the persons to bring and have the more members, but those um, uh, young women were actually used also to, to attract more male fighters. And um, when we looked at the cases of uh, children, for example, there were lots of, uh, in the case of children, even though there is no means to, to prove that the child has been trafficked, so the acts and the exploitation or intent to exploitation is enough, but the position of vulnerability, because by virtue of the age, child is already vulnerable. So it's very important for uh, when looking at the child cases, it's important to look at what kind of means were used. So when we're talking about grooming online, what exactly been used, how the child has been recruited. So it's very important. I was just last week we were in the UK. So there was this interesting cases. Apparently uh, one of 10 children who are actually being recruited by far right in the UK uh, persons about uh, below 18 now. And one of the cases that now last week, uh, we, when we were talking with the Crown Prosecution Service, um, uh, who, the girl of 14 years old who was, who has been uh, recruited by far right, uh, then she was accused. There were six charges against different kind of terrorism. She was actually making the bombs. She was uh, learning how to make a bombs online. So, but the national crime agencies then looked at it and they realized actually there were lots of elements of how the child were not only deceived and, and coerced and radicalized, but also she was actually sexually groomed by another adult. So another adult of the far right group was actually at the same time grooming. So the child was actually at the same time was sexually groomed, but also being radicalized at the same time. So there were like very powerful two tricks for playing. So. The CPS, which is Crime Prosecution Service, actually dropped the um, uh, indictment, however, and the child was taken then to the child care services. And now at the age of 16, she committed a suicide. Actually, she died a few weeks ago. So it's quite an unfortunate case, but it shows again how um, a vulnerability factor was so big in that case. And uh, the same just a few weeks ago, because we had this country visits one back to back. We were also in Norway, and it's another case of non punishment principle just being applied to a young lady uh, on the basis of the papers that we developed. What happened is that uh, in the course of a case, it was revealed that although the person actually voluntarily joined ISIL, uh, a young woman, uh, she wasn't a child, but her circumstances has changed when she actually already been in Syria. Also, she traveled there with her husband, uh, but after the husband died, she was actually sold into sex slaves, so she had to deliver multiple children and so forth. So in the course of a whole case trial, the judge came 
um, looked at our paper. She looked through the paper. She read through it. Also, the, in, interestingly, in Norway, Norwegian legislation, uh, there is no non-punishment principle. They actually use the Council of Europe Convention to actually apply the principle. So they actually now apply that principle to drop all the prosecution charges from um, from the victim of uh, trafficking. Although the, the case is still under appeal, but that's another case to look at it also once it's, uh, it's finalized. So as a last person, so we looked at the purpose, whether there is a purpose or intent of exploitation of the person. So as I said, the data that we compiled, we realized that the persons were actually targeted for their utility. So the terrorist groups looked and targeted those people, what we can get out of these persons. So when we looked at the children, there were two ways how they were trafficked. Either they were trafficked through the online grooming or the, the parents brought them into, into Syria and Iraq. And then either they aged out of the child uh, age, basically once the conflict was taken and ISIL was defeated, or um, the parent died and then the person uh, ended up in a situation where uh, the child was taken to the armed groups. And there were lots of cases, and one of them was 25 children aged of 7 to 16 years old who were actually um, uh, trained in the camp controlled by fighters. It was in Afghanistan, and the children were from Tajiks and Uzbek, uh, but they were children um, uh, deprived of parental care. So those children were actually trained in combat, and they had no control of themselves. So uh, at the time when we were drafted, drafting this report, these children were already uh, reportedly sold to um, to the group affiliated with ISIL in Afghanistan. So this is all, uh, again just a wrap up on uh, on the gender and age to say that um, there are distinct pathways. So we're, in our report, we don't say that all women or all children who have been recruited or who have been involved in terrorism are all victims. But the cases needs to be looked at from trafficking lens. And once looked at, there is a big chance that there are lots of deception or any other means have been used in the recruitment phase. That's why in our report, we try to really focus on the in instances of to see how the person is actually recruited in the first stage, and then to look at afterwards whether or not they've been exploitation or not. So this, I know that I'm a bit run out of time, apparently. So um, that's the key takeaways. Again, um, we also came up with the recommendations uh, according to the P, for P structures and separate ones for children. We, uh, we looked at where we actually suggest, we recommend that the states actually establish working groups, and some of them actually did, and we were in both names, Jane. And there were already ideas in, in some of the countries to establish these joint working groups where two disciplines, counterterrorism and counter-traffic national sit together and examine the cases once they come on an individual basis and look at those cases through trafficking lens. Uh, we looked at the principle of non-punishment in relation to victims. It remains one of these controversial areas. There are lots of states, including the UK, that we were last, year, last week and in Nor Norway last week, that many countries do not have that non-punishment principle uh, enshrined in the laws, or they have, even if it's there, they have this list of offenses, which basically petty offenses, pickpocketing or, or any of the small um, deeds that are included in those list of offenses that can be applied uh, for non-punishment punishment principle. So in our recommendations, we call for non-punishment principle, especially in relation to children, uh, where the best interest of the child needs to be taken into account. So the, our website, um, we have it only in English now in the website. We will be translating documents to different other languages. I can post the link here in the chat um, uh, if interested. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sharana. That would be great to post the link. Uh, Professor Mulali, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Very nice to see you all. Um, greetings from Galway. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you and to talk about this uh, topic on the intersections between trafficking and terrorism. Um, this was a, a topic that I looked at with the support of the Duke International Human Rights Law Clinic, um, specifically in 2021 in, in two reports. One um, which was dedicated to this topic um, 
and presented to the UN General Assembly, the third committee in October of 2021. And the other report, uh, which was presented to the Human Rights Council in June of 2021, looked at the principle of non-punishment um, that Tirana has just been talking about also. And as part of that, um, included a reflection on how the principle of non-punishment uh, might apply in the context of victims of trafficking allegedly involved with or engaged with um, terrorist groups or groups designated as terrorist by the UN. Um, so it's a topic that I've continued to engage with in terms of engagement uh, with regional courts, the European Court of Human Rights, um, and with some domestic proceedings as well. Uh, and I've been asked here this afternoon just to talk a little bit about the legal framework that applies. And I'm going to talk relatively briefly to allow some time for discussion. Um, but at its core, the legal framework that applies to trafficking in the context of terrorism is the same legal framework that applies to trafficking more broadly or ought to apply. So the Palermo Protocol, international human rights law provisions in relation to the prohibition of trafficking and protection of victims, international humanitarian law and international criminal law, um, and aspects of international refugee law, uh, where there may be a question around access to or rights of access to international protection for victims of trafficking, but also the potential of punishment through exclusion um, from refugee status. Separately, there is a wider international law framework um, that, as Tirana mentioned, may be relevant uh, with regard to those victims of trafficking who are also victims of terrorism. And in the context of conflict situations where terrorist groups are engaged or you've UN designated terrorist groups, there is the body of law and reporting obligations that arise in relation to children and armed conflict and the mandate of the special representative of the Secretary General on children and armed conflict and how the concept of grave violations against children in armed conflict, how that in, can incorporate um, obligations of prevention and protection and accountability with regard to child victims of trafficking, uh, where you have terrorist groups or groups designated as terrorist operating. And we also have the wider um, body of international law relating to sexual violence and conflict, um, where again, the trafficking terrorism nexus can arise. And this is something that has been addressed um, by the UN Secretary General, um, for example, in the more recent, uh, the seventh review of the global counterterrorism strategy, um, the Secretary General specifically looked at sexual violence as a tactic of terrorism and as linked to the strategic objectives uh, of certain terrorist groups. And as part of that, uh, included also reference to risks of trafficking in persons. There have been some um, country specific situations where the UN Security Council has addressed trafficking in persons and terrorism. Um, for example, in Security Council Resolution 2584 uh, on the situation in Mali, where a priority task for the mandate of MINUSMA, um, the UN stabilization mission in Mali, includes a, a wider focus on violations and abuses committed against women and children um, and includes a specific reference to trafficking in persons. Um, with regard to the question of why this nexus arises uh, and why it is of interest, um, it has been recognised that terrorist groups engage in a range of forms of trafficking in persons for a range of different purposes. Most attention is given to for the purposes of child and forced marriage, for the purposes of sexual exploitation, including sexual slavery. But there are also the purposes of domestic servitude and forced labor and forced criminality, uh, exploitation in criminal activities. And 
of concern, I think, in the context of peacekeeping, peace building and peacekeeping transitions is that this activity can be a way or a strategy of disrupting a peace agreement or a peace process. It can prolong a conflict um, or undermine a, a peace process. And often what we see happening is that parties to a conflict continue on or take on different forms, um, continuing or persisting as armed groups, in some instances engaging in terrorist activities, and in some instances being designated as such uh, as terrorist groups. Why is this a difficult topic um, for those working on international law relating to human trafficking? I think it is because um, the victims are often not seen as such, not recognized as such. So the ordinary rules and principles of international law that ought to apply with regard to human trafficking are not applied in practice. So non-discrimination, non-punishment, positive obligations of assistance and protection and recognition of the irrelevance of consent where any of the means are used, force, coercion, deception, and the irrelevance of consent with regard to children and the ir irrelevance of establishing means. So those are simply not applied in the same way or their application is questioned or they are not acknowledged in, in the same way. So in terms of what is the international law framework, it includes a positive obligation to identify victims, a positive obligation on the part of the state, so not waiting for self-identification or self-reporting, a positive obligation to provide assistance and protection without discrimination, uh, and a principle of non-punishment, which, as Tirana said, it's not found in the Palermo Protocol as such. It is found in the guidelines and principles on human rights and human trafficking of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's found in the Council of Europe Anti-Trafficking Convention, and it's found in a range of other uh, soft law instruments. And interesting, I think, is the, the um, judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in the AN and VCL versus the UK, the case involving Vietnamese boys who were trafficked for the purpose of cannabis cultivation where the European Court of Human Rights recognized the non-punishment principle as being linked to the positive obligation to provide assistance and protection to victims, but also, interestingly, as directly linked to the right to a fair trial protected by Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So the failure to identify a victim as such would undermine um, the victim's right to a fair trial with regard to the charges being brought. The challenge with regard to the nexus between trafficking and terrorism, where there's uh, an allegation that a victim of trafficking has been engaged in terrorist activities or is associated with a terrorist group, um, is that the, the gravity of the alleged offences may be great, and so the scope of the non-punishment principle is questioned, that it should only apply to minor offences as such, not regardless of the gravity of the, the offence, which it has been argued it should be, including by me. Um, the non-discrimination principle, I think, is critical here because a, a key problem that we see in international law relating to human trafficking and its practice is that victims of trafficking are not identified as such. And that is because to a significant extent, racism, racial discrimination, racial injustice precludes or prevents that identification and leaves brings us to a situation where we have failures of assistance and protection. Um, this is something that I highlighted in my report um, to the Human Rights Council and to the G General Assembly also um, that discrimination by states leads to a failure to identify victims of trafficking as such and to consequent failures of protection where we see trafficking occurring in the context of terrorism.
And again, it was something that I highlighted to the third committee, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, about problems with regard to racial profiling by law enforcement officials, which often led to failures to identify victims of trafficking. The, an interesting question, and I, I'll conclude just by reflecting on, on, on this, um, is the, the whole question of the, the scope of the obligation of repatriation of victims of trafficking. Um, because here the Palermo Protocol, the Trafficking in Persons Protocol, is quite strict in that it uses the language of shall, the state shall facilitate repatriation, the state of the victim's nationality. Um, but in a recent uh, judgment of the European Court of Human Rights, just in September uh, earlier this year, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights in HF and others versus France um, looked at this question. It was a, a case concerning the repatriation of uh, children and their mothers from Syrian camps. Uh, I had submitted an amicus curiae uh, to the court, as did uh, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism. Um, there have also been a number of communications and decisions from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and interestingly, um, Professor Helen Duffy has uh, commented that the context of these cases is morally disturbing and politically toxic. And that's what adds to the difficulty, I think. Um, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights said in, in addressing the obligation arising under Protocol 4 uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights about the right to enter one's own uh, national territory. The European Court of Human Rights said there wasn't an obligation to repatriate as such, um, but there was an obligation to ensure safeguards against arbitrary decision making with regard to requests for repatriation and decisions on repatriation. And in this case, they said that there was a procedural obligation to ensure appropriate safeguards and those had not been provided. So there was a violation of the protocol to the convention, but a, a violation of this procedural obligation as such. Um, and interestingly, in um, a number of separate opinions and dissenting opinions at the court, this criticism of the majority decision from both sides, if you like. Um, on, on the one hand, two of the judges argue that the majority proceduralist approach didn't go far enough in not establishing a substantive obligation um, to end the de facto exile of the, the children in this case and their mothers. And the dissenting judges said that in finding a violation of the procedural safeguards, it went too far. Um, at the same time, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, has issued a number of decisions, um, finding that the states of which um, children uh, were nationals, that they had an obligation to repatriate, that the failure to do so was a violation of the best interests of the child, of the right to life, and of the prohibition of torture. And with regard to jurisdiction, they said that there was jurisdiction because it was possible um, for the states in question, France included, uh, to engage with the Kurdish authorities and to facilitate repatriation. Now, I should say that these were not directly addressing trafficking as such. Um, and when I submitted the amicus curiae to the European Court of Human Rights, I was wondering if they would comment that trafficking hadn't been raised by the applicants in the case. They didn't do that and they acknowledged the amicus and referred to the issues raised with regard to trafficking without saying that they were victims of trafficking as such. And neither did the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child um, identify this, but they bring in the broader human rights obligations. So I think there we see an interesting development um, and in practice, we are seeing more repatriations happening. So there's an acknowledgement, but somewhat of a reluctance, at least on the part of the European Court of Human Rights, to say that there's extraterritorial jurisdiction as such and an obligation to repatriate, but a recognition of the need for procedural safeguards.
but the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child going much further and saying, yes, jurisdiction is engaged and there is a substantive obligation to provide protection, which could be read as also including an obligation to provide protection and repatriation with regard to victims of trafficking. So I'm just going to leave it there and over to you for any questions uh, or comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mullally, and we'll end with Professor Huckerley. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I thought it might be helpful at this juncture to do a really sort of quick recap of the ways in which terrorist groups use trafficking in persons and then sort of turn to um, the barriers of accountability in this space that are a combination of the legal framework challenges, the political challenges, and exactly echoing Professor Duffy's comments on the moral challenges too. Um, so just, just to quickly recap, you know, we're all at different stages around understanding the nexus. Um, you know, the question of how terrorist or other prescribed actors use human trafficking um, really became a topic um, of attention from a, a range of multilateral institutions, um, primarily brought on um, by the way in which ISIS or ISIL was using trafficking in persons. Um, and so if you trace the different connective tissues that are drawn between um, a variety of different statements of the UN and other bodies, there are essentially four ways that um, terrorist groups are identified as using trafficking in persons. The first of which is for recruitment, and that's what we've been talking about mainly today, and I'll talk more about that. So recruitment in terms of trafficking of recruits. So you know, um, trafficking of a girl and to be married to a foreign fighter in the case of ISIS, um, trafficking of a boy um, to fight for a prescribed group, um, trafficking of um, adult men um, to provide labor um, for a prescribed group. So the recruitment of the uh, individual is trafficked in that process. A second way, um, which has been a little bit debunked, but took the attention of the international community for a while, um, was the idea that terrorist groups would use trafficking in persons to increase their financial flows. Right? It was a lucrative um, criminal enterprise um, that should be regulated via enhanced um, counterterrorism financing machinery. I say that got debunked because the actual connection between trafficking in persons and financial outputs for terrorist groups was found to be pretty minimal. Um, and there's a lot of concern and pushback from human rights groups that actually states were using that as a pretext to enhance quite coercive counterterrorism financing measures when it didn't really match the reality of the threat emanating um, from trafficking in persons in that regard. The third area, as has been foreshadowed by Professor Malali, is um, the uh, terrorist groups would use trafficking in persons uh, to enhance the strategic objectives. Um, so that whether that be um, looking at sexual violence as a tactic um, of a prescribed group, as it has been the recent attention um, from various parts of uh, multilateral um, institutions, um, and, and so forth. And the whole, um, sort of connection that was drawn by the international community between terrorism and trafficking was the idea that terrorist groups would use trafficking to strengthen influence, to control territory, um, to destroy communities um, who they were, you know, targeting for trafficking persons. What has been really interesting and what we're sort of talking about here is trying to understand, you know, which of those four kind of con connections that have been drawn have actually been followed through um, in a meaningful way by the international community and where are we mobilising legal frameworks to understand those issues and where are we not mobilising legal frameworks. And so I want to focus particularly as we've been doing today on the question of recruitment because it really highlights some of the issues that emerge um, in thinking about the potential opportunities but also gaps in how we think about these questions. So. Here we're really talking about the question of you know, trying to understand whether um, someone has um, who is linked to a prescribed group has been trafficked. Okay, so you're looking at um, a case profile, as I mentioned, of you know a, a young girl who may have travelled to um, Syria and married a, a foreign fighter. Right, is there trafficking in that? process. Uh, are you talking about someone who um, tells you they had gone to Turkey on the understanding they were going to be uh, working in Syria and were then arrived in Syria at that time in Raqqa and had their passport taken and were unable to leave the group. So trying to understand like in these fact patterns is there trafficking in persons and what the consequences might be. As we've talked about trafficking in persons under international law if you're an adult requires three things to occur. You need to have an act, so recruitment, transfer, uh, transport, harbouring. 
by a certain means, and the trafficking, human trafficking protocol, the Palermo protocol, covers both explicitly coercive means, such as kidnapping and use of force. It also, carry, it also covers non-explicit means, so deception, abuse of a position of vulnerability, fraud, right, and so forth. Too. So you need an act by a certain means with an intent to exploit. And that intent to exploit can be for criminal activity, exactly as Professor Malai talked about. It could be for sexual exploitation. It could be for forced marriage. It could be for forced labor, right? So you have a whole range of purposes that you know very much line up with how terrorist groups use recruits like in certain um, activities. So that's our definition. And if you can apply that definition, it ushers in a whole range of protections that, again, have all been gone through, so I won't repeat them. But key among them um, is a principle of non-punishment, which, as we've talked about, essentially is if you are a victim of trafficking in persons who engages in forced criminality as a result of having been trafficked, right, which is kind of what the purpose of a lot of trafficking in persons is, is to force someone to engage in, in criminality, then we don't prosecute or otherwise punish that person for those activities, right, just to kind of do the most nutshell statement like that. Okay, so as Professor Malali said, this framework um, on international law and trafficking in persons should apply equally to trafficking that is undertaken by prescribed groups, right? There's no terrorism carve-out that's baked into these rules. The idea is they apply to every situation of trafficking like, in persons. But um, in practice, um, I think in many ways what we've seen um, over the last sort of 10 years, which the last five years, has been... You know, an extraordinary um, pushback from a number of governments who are resisting um, the full application of international anti-trafficking law, international criminal law, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, international refugee law when it comes to terrorism. And I was going to go through and give, I began listing out the barriers and I kind of got beyond 10 and then I was like, okay, this is getting weird. This is a lot like, to, to go through. But there are a lot of barriers to trying to get governments to understand how to take seriously the application of their law and the obligations to trafficking by terrorist groups. The one thing I, I do want to echo exactly as Professor Malali has really charted the way for understanding this for everyone um, is the violation of non-discrimination guarantees are really key here. So it is striking, as Tarana talked about, that you can have an example of in the UK where the prosecutorial services were willing to see trafficking in persons of a young girl groomed by a right-wing extremist group, when they have resolutely refused to apply trafficking in persons frameworks to um, analyse the cases of young Muslim girls um, who were groomed by ISIS. And so noting that disparity between different types of terrorism is one way in which we can see the non-discrimination guarantee being violated. But again, this broader like pushback from governments on applying trafficking law to those trafficked by terrorist groups results in discriminatory outcomes um, based upon who your trafficker is. And that doesn't match up with the international human rights law framework on this. The second big failure um, has been to, and again, this might seem a little bit um, you know, counterintuitive, but it's just important to name these failures quite directly. There's a huge failure um, to prevent, to apply prevent obligations. So part of the piece that um, Toronto talked us through is you have an obligation to prevent trafficking from your territory. So if I'm the French government, you know, I have an obligation if I can see recruitment, online recruitment taking place like in France of, let's say, young women, um, I have an obligation to prevent trafficking of um, and recruitment of that person from my territory to an, another country. Right? And governments can sometimes um, be resistant to applying that prevent obligation. The third challenge can be exactly as Professor Malali um, identified is really this resistance to applying the idea of extraterritorial obligations, right? So the, the, tr the trick that we have right now in the human rights space, particularly when we're talking about those who are linked to ISIS, is you have a number of individuals who are now in Syria or Iraq. So they're outside their country of origin, right? You're trying to get a government like France, UK, Australia, <laughs> Canada, to take responsibility to apply extraterritorially outside their territory their obligations to help their citizens, right, or help those um, who are linked to the country. But that requires a, a legal argumentation around extending legal obligations to that third country, and states really push back on, on that. 
A fourth failure that um, has been really striking in this area is the governments really um, are resisting when you're trying to engage with them on this population of people who we would argue have been who are linked to terrorism, and we, we try and ask them to, to get into those fact patterns and figure out if there was trafficking. They um, don't want to do that proactively. Um, and so you get a lot of either explicit or implicit argumentation that victims have to self-identify, right? That if you are dealing with um, a trafficked, someone who has been linked to a prescribed group, that if they haven't raised the, the prospect, you know, of having been trafficked, the government has an obligation. And that goes is totally antithetical to how we think about a human rights framework in this space, particularly for, for children, right? We don't re we rely on children to self-identify as having been trafficked. Um, and so maybe to a couple, mindful of the times, three more big barriers. Um, big issue has been, I mentioned that the means of trafficking and persons in, in the UN Trafficking Protocol cover explicitly coercive, like kidnapping, Course, and then non-explicitly coercive, so deception, abuse of position of vulnerability, and so forth. Um, it is very hard to get governments to think about those non-coercive, explicitly coercive means. Um, so, for example, to talk about um, what role deception might have played. So, for example, if you look at a case where um, a woman who travelled to Syria was genuinely deceived about the conditions of what her experience would be like under um, ISIS-controlled territory, um, this could amount to trafficking persons if there's an exploitative purpose involved in that. But the, the idea of deception and the non-explicitly non -coerc non coercive can be much harder for um, a number of stakeholders to, to address. Um, another issue that we see a lot in practice, and Tarana hinted at this, um, is under international law, we have a difference between how we define an adult victim of trafficking in persons and a child. So I mentioned there are three components required when you're an adult trafficked. You've got to be, there's got to be an act with a means, with an intent to exploit, right? So three things. As Professor Malali mentioned, if you have any of the means that are used, if you show consent, that consent is deemed not to be real consent, right? It's not um, shown as evidencing agency. But with children, we evacuate that requirement of showing the means, right? The, the idea being that a child can't, under any circumstances, consent to their own exploitation. It's not possible. So what we require is an act with an intent to exploit. Okay, But in practice, what we have seen um, is that governments tend to apply the definition of, child, of adult trafficking to child trafficking victims, right? So they you know, insist on their, um, if you look at a situation where you have a child um, who for all sort of, you know, objective um, appearances may have appeared to be a willing a willing member of traveling to, to a group. They, they insist upon that willingness at agency expression. Um, but again, under international law, that is irrelevant, right? The, the, the means are actually irrelevant because the, the child cannot consent. Um, so for example, um, the UN, um, UNODC gives a, a strong example of this, of you know, if you have um, an under 18 boy um, who goes online, pays a smuggler, right? So that looks volitional, it looks like an agency expression. Uh, to go to a prescribed group, okay? He's recruited online, pays a smuggler, and goes. Um, that would be trafficking in persons under international law because all we need is an act, the recruitment, right, of that kid, with an intent to join a prescribed group, to, to fight for a prescribed group, to be engaged in criminality. The means by which it occurred are legally irrelevant um, because he was a child, um, when undertaking those activities. So, but again, in, in practice, governments tend to want to put back in like that focus um, on agency with kids, partly because, as Tarana mentioned, um, a number of situations with which we deal are when you've had someone who was a child recruited to a prescribed group who is now of age, right? So they're required, they're recruited as a kid, they're transported as a kid, but then now we're looking at a situation when they've engaged in criminal activities as an adult. Um, the final um, challenge um, that we have, and I just, it's exactly the challenge, and I, I'm not going to go into, into it because it's been talked about so well, um, is the failure to apply the non-punishment principle um, when victims of trafficking commit terrorist offences as a result of being trafficked. And, you know, we can go through um, 
the legal reasons why that's wrong. Um, but it's a really great example of, again, if any of you th who are thinking through, you know, engaging in human rights practice and, and what that looks like, um, this is a, a block of where you don't, there's a reluctance on many stakeholders, including the public, um, to see this duality of someone being both a perpetrator and a victim, right? And so rather than treating people as victims with corresponding rights guarantees, um, those linked to terrorist groups can often be wrongly criminalised, stigmatised, can have their nationality deprived by the government, can be refused repatriation um, by their governments. Um, and again, that really is entirely antithetical to the non-punishment principle, but it's not entirely illegal. It is in some cases legal argumentation with governments around that, but in other cases it's understanding that there's a, just a overarching um, reluctance um, to extend human rights protections fully like in, in these cases. But I'm going to stop because we have, we want to have some time for questions um, too. Thank you, Professor Huckerby. And um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yes, please. Did you hear the questions? Okay. Um, so the question I just repeated was around whether there is a limiting principle on the principle of non-punishment, um, especially in situations where the coercion is one of the less explicit forms. Ms. Molly, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good question. And actually, there's an interesting um, judgment uh, pending at the International Criminal Court, uh, the Appeals Chamber, in relation to the Dominic Ongwin case. Dominic Ongwin is a former child soldier. Um, and the case arose in relation to the situation in Uganda. And the Appeals Chamber um, has been asked by the defence to consider the application of the principle of non-punishment to Dominic Ongwen. Um, it wasn't raised earlier, um, and the question of him as a, a victim of trafficking wasn't raised at earlier stages of the trial. So I think it would be very interesting to see how the Appeals Chamber applies it, um, because the charges that were brought against Dom Dominic Ongwen at the International Criminal Court related to um, offences allegedly committed as an adult, not to those um, committed allegedly as a child. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how far, if at all, um, they consider the non-punishment principle to be relevant. Um, with regard to more generally the application, there isn't an exception as such. It The non-punishment principle ought to apply regardless of the gravity of the offence. Uh, where the offence uh, is committed as a direct consequence of being a victim of trafficking. So that's a, a question to determine um, whether or not, in fact, that link, that nexus can be made. And that's a challenging one, but we often have those kinds of difficulties in, in legal proceedings. Um, so it's, it's also should apply in a somewhat different way to, for example, a defense of duress and necessity, which is more a momentary or immediate um, threat, if you like. So the idea of the non-punishment principle is that it would take account of a, a broader or ongoing um, context in which a, a person is a victim of trafficking and uh, commits a, an unlawful act as a consequence of being trafficked. So it falls to be determined on a case by case scenario, but in terms of the principle as such, there isn't a, a specific a exception, um, but the factual context has to be assessed and has to be assessed without discrimination as as um, 
Professor Huckabee emphasised there as well, but that's where we often see a challenge in practice. Thank you. Sharna, would you like to add anything? Um, yes, uh, in our discussion, because we also do the country visits and during country visits, we do discuss um, the non-punishment principle in detail. Of course, the duress and necessity this is one of those um, which exists in almost every criminal code in the countries, uh, which is very difficult to prove. And every time when there's a question, if you have a non-punishment principle, the states usually direct us to this duress-based uh, um, provisions, which is almost never applied unless uh, it's really, really something physical happening. So it's very difficult to prove, but um, uh, in, in several discussions, especially in Western European countries, uh, where the Council of Europe Convention applies, uh, so the discussion was that how the wording of the conventions actually has been built uh, to provide guidance. So Article 26 says that each party shall, in accordance with the basic principle of its legal system, provide for the possibility of not imposing penalties on victims for their involvement in unlawful activities to the extent that they have been compelled to do so. So they take that wording basically as in full a in the perusal of the prosecution service to or not to prosecute. So they basically say it's not mandatory, it's only just for our consideration, but it's up to the national legal system to see if it's uh, like in the UK, if they would prosecute um, for the interest of the public order or not. Um, but again, um, after what happened with the Begums case, there are lots of different laws that came up, popped up uh, after that, like a nationality and borders bill that provide even more stricter rules in, in, in relation how the victims of trafficking could be protected from criminalization. And in cases of terrorism, it actually says those cases of terrorism or any person that's related to terrorism cannot be, uh, even if they're trafficking victims, then punishment principle will not apply or even any protection, they're actually um, excluded from any protection yeah, under the trafficking law. So the states are starting to use a different models of laws for not uh, apply the non-punishment principle. So I would say as an IC official, we see it as more polit political dis discussion rather than legal discussion, because in most of the cases, it only relates, again, as uh, Professor Hackerby mentioned, in many cases, be, it relates to cases like Bikum, but it didn't relate, uh, it didn't apply it in the cases when the far right, the young girl, also she committed suicide at the end, it was an unfortunate case, but uh, it's luckily, uh, the non-punishment principle luckily was applied in that case. But again, um, in the less severe cases where Bikum did not commit any proof of evidence of committing any crime, that non-punishment principle was not applied. So this is where I see there is more artificial challenges uh, made into uh, considering to or not to apply the provision in practice. I should just maybe add really quickly, I think your, your question really encapsulated exactly the reason why governments are reluctant to fully apply this, which is that it then requires a much more calibrated approach to understanding not only, you know, taking a non-prosecutorial uh, posture, but then thinking in a much more holistic way about what reintegration might look like or, you know, beyond a, a, a sort of punishment scenario, how to address these, these questions. And just for everyone to be on the same page, we've been talking a lot about the Shamima Begum case. Um, Shamima Begum is a, a, was 15 when she was recruited um, online by, on, by a known recruiter um, and travelled um, from London um, to Syria where she was married off to an adult fighter um, very quickly. She's been deprived of her nationality by the UK government. She's presently stranded um, in a, a camp um, in uh, northeast Syria. And these questions that Shrana is talking us through are exactly around, and she's never had an allegation of, um, criminal, of criminal, criminality um, of what she may or may not have done um, in, in Syria. And so there's questions around when you mobilise on punishment, when you don't, um, are very much um, brought into sharp relief uh, by, her, by her treatment. Unfortunately, that brings us to time. Um, so thank you again all for joining us today and huge thanks to our three speakers, Professor Mulali, Tarana Bagarova, and Professor Huckerby for um, such insightful presentations today. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you, bye.